Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Temptation, not those temptations. They said, as they're coming up with this name, it needs to be something forbidden. Something everyone wants, but no one can have. It's got to be something sexy. Temptation. And let's be honest, temptation is alluring. That's why it's a temptation. Temptation is fun. Let's be honest, sin is fun for a season or else we wouldn't do it. Sin wouldn't be a temptation if there was not some kind of benefit to us temporarily. And then we don't want to admit that. No, Pastor Mike, we're in church, you can't say that. No, let's just be honest. You wouldn't struggle with a specific sin if it didn't somehow benefit you even temporarily. But we know that there's a sting that comes to the other side of that. Temptation always looks good. It always looks enticing. It always looks attractive. No, it doesn't, Pastor Mike. We need to stop this. We need to put an end to the devil and all these things. Well, I just want to give you the definition of the word temptation. Let's take a look at this. Temptation is the desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. The desire to do something. Now, temptation could be a good thing. We could have good temptations. Things that are inspiring us to do better, be better, that therefore it wouldn't have such a negative connotation. But mostly, it's especially something wrong or unwise. So has anybody ever been on a weight loss journey? As a child, I had to wear husky clothes. We don't say that stuff anymore. We don't say husky because it gives people complexes like it gave me. No, son, you cannot shop in the normal clothes section, you need to go to the husky boy section. And I had to go to the fat clothes section and get my fat clothes, right? So I have been on weight loss journeys my whole life, ups and downs, I'm going to get back in shape. So right now I'm kind of on a weight loss journey. Um, I'm, not, I'm not into the gym much anymore, I've had too many gym injuries, so I'm trying to lose weight golfing. How about that? Golfing, is that a good way to lose weight? If you want to come help me today, we're playing golf over at the town of Walk Hill across the highway there at 4 o'clock. Beyond par, come on out, play some golf with us at 4 o'clock today. But that's, you know, that's my way right now. I'm trying to, you know, not eat so many carbohydrates, cut the sugar, eat the proper amounts of food. And so, you know inevitably that when you start that health food journey, it looks like this. There's the great food on the table. We're going to have the asparagus, we're going to have the avocado, the good fats. We're going to try to stay away from the brown sugar, but we got, I don't know, paprika back there, or cinnamon. I think it's cinnamon. I don't know what that stuff is over there. But that's the, turmeric, okay. But that's the picture of the table in your mind, like this is what I'm going to commit to do. And then you get to the lunchroom table at work, and it looks something like this. Oh, my God, that looks so good right now. I mean, I'll be honest with you, right? And so that just, oh, my God, I know what a greasy cheeseburger, extra patty, bacon, french fries, onion rings. No, I got to stay strong. And then you try to start, then you start judging everybody else. Oh, that's what you're eating for lunch? <laughs> I've got berries and nuts. You have that difficult week, you haven't been sleeping right, the dog made a mess in the house, the kids are acting crazy, and then you have that temptation to revert to your coping mechanism. Okay, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I eat. I'm a stress eater. I'm a happy eater. I'm a bored eater. Come on, somebody. And I'm just an eater. So I don't even need an occasion to eat bad things. I just enjoy bad food. Trying to work out, go to the gym, trying to lose weight, trying to look good. And then someone brings Duncan. Duncan. Now you think this is an empty box. 
It is not. It is loaded today with all the goodies. And I've been good. I haven't had a donut in quite some time. A donut with a black coffee, especially like, okay, the blueberry I like. Boston cream I like, the chocolate, coconut. I'm not so much into this thing here. Someone can have that. I'm not so much into the pink frosting. An old-fashioned is just a waste of time. (laughs) This is like a fake donut. Right? Why? Why? It is in my notes to partake of one of these donuts while I'm preaching today. What would you say to that? Amen. 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 See, my brother right there, Antonio, is tempting me to break my diet in front of the whole church. He's saying, Pastor, it's okay for you to sin in front of all of us today. See, that's the voice of Satan that Entered Peter when he was combating Jesus. And I'm using the illustration of donuts today because this is somewhat of an innocent temptation. I know that there are varying degrees in this room of things that we deal with in our personal lives of temptation. There are varying degrees of monkeys that we have on our shoulder or crosses that we bear different things throughout our lives that have tried to attach themselves to us. And here's what I do know. Most of us are not tempted with new sin. Most of us are tempted with the same sin from when we were like 14 to 18 years old. It's that same thing that we tasted of as a teenager that our body said is good, and therefore every time it pops up, it's one of those things like, man, this is enticing. So today we're going to talk about the journey out of temptation. The journey out of temptation. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside everything that weighs us down and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance. So Pastor Josh is training for a big hike that he's doing in Seattle. He's going to summit a 10,000-foot mountaintop. And so he's been practicing. And so he went golfing with me the other day. And instead of carrying his golf bag, he carried a rock sack with 45 pounds of weight in it. And what I know about that is after 18 holes of golf, over 7,000 yards of hiking, 15,000 steps that he did, he did not run up the hill to the 18th hole. He was not running with endurance with that much weight on his back in the heat of the day. And there's so many of us that are trying to run the race with the things of God in our lives, and we got some heavy weights on our back. He says this, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's the finish line. That's the finish line of our lives, right? The finisher of our faith. For who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the Father on the throne. Let's go ahead and open in prayer today. Father, we thank you and praise you for your time and your word. I pray, God, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Help us to not feel condemnation today but help us to see the freedom that we have in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to look at a story of a man who's pretty famous in Christianity. He had his own box of donut struggle. He had his own temptations that he dealt with in his life. And the only difference is that his box of donuts was concerned with carrying the weight of the world not just the weight of a few extra pounds. Check this out. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4 today. And beginning in verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That is a perplexing statement. It's a confusing statement. So first we have to understand this. 
that Jesus was not tempted by God. Who does it say he was tempted by? To be tempted by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. He was tempted by the devil. God cannot tempt you. It is against his character. It is against who he is. But he was led by the Holy Spirit into a place of temptation. Like, whoa, wait a second, this is crazy. Listen, the Holy Spirit would have never led him into a position that he would not have already had victory in. The Bible says, in every temptation, God makes a way of escape so that you are not tempted beyond what you could bear. Okay, the problem is, is that we do not respond to temptation the way Jesus did. We respond to temptation the way Adam and Eve did. Don't we? Man, that donut looks great. I'm thinking about the blueberry one specifically. I think I'd like to take the blueberry donut and pull the cream out of the Boston cream and put it on the blueberry and make my own new donut. We need to be careful to not go up to other believers who are struggling and say things like, well, you must not be following the Holy Spirit if you're going through temptation. Well, if you're going through something in your life, there must be some unconfessed sin that you have in your life. I remember when I was in Bible school, I got really, really sick. I contracted an internal gastrointestinal disease. I almost died. And uh, all my friends from Bible college, they came to my dorm room and they were going to do an intervention. An intervention. And so I thought they would come over to hang out with me, show me some love, pray for me. No, it was an intervention. I didn't know that. They all sat around in my apartment and they were like, Mike, what kind of unconfessed sin do you have in your life that's allowing the devil to do this to you? Well, I showed them what kind of sin I had. I cussed them all out, kicked them out of my apartment. <laughs> for real, true story. True story. Cussed them out with all the great cuss words, not just the little ones, like the good ones. And once I ran him out, out of my apartment, I ran into my bedroom and I just began to cry out to God. And I was like, I don't understand. Because I was reading my Bible every day. I was in Bible school. I was writing my own commentary to the Bible. I was at the height of my spiritual life. I had never been so close to God and so into the things of God. And let me tell you something. The apostle Paul said this, lest I be exalted above measure, there was given to me a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure, right? And I'm just gonna tell you this. The, the, the more you stand up and the more you stick out and the more you go after the things of God, you actually become a target. Antonio, can you stand up for me for a second? Can everybody in the room see Antonio? Why? Because he is now exalted above measure. Measure is the seated, thank you. Measure is the seated position and someone over here can't see him right now. But lest he stand up and make a difference and go after the things of God, the enemy came after Paul to knock him down. So he was not exalted above measure. And there's plenty of stories throughout the Bible, but let's take a look at Matthew 4, verse 2. It says this, and after 40 days of fasting and 40 nights of fasting, Jesus was hangry. No, he wasn't hangry. He was hungry. He was hungry. I'm just going to tell you, I've been doing intermittent fasting, which means like you fast for like 16 hours and then you only eat for eight hour window of time. And by the time it's time to eat, my body knows, right? It is hurting. That's only 16 hours. Could you imagine 40 days? Let's be honest to ourselves. If you miss breakfast or your morning coffee, you're in a bad mood. I like to watch the show on Netflix, the series called Alone. These people like survivalists. They go out to the wilderness and they have to survive off the land and beat other people and see how long they can survive. And the one I'm watching right now, they're like 15 days in and they've already lost like 20 to 30 pounds. Their minds are already like playing tricks on them. They're bugging out. They're, all, they're obsessed. All they can think about is food. And that's just 15 days. Your boy Jesus was 40 days and nights. And watch what happens. At his weakest moment, verse three, the tempter came 
to him and said, if you are the son of man, let these stones become bread. Or if you are the son of man, turn these stones into something to eat. Turn it into some blueberry Dunkin' Donuts. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So a temptation comes right at his weakest point. Even so, being his weakest point, th thus far, it's one of his greatest victories. He did what he was called to do. I'm gonna tell you this, beware of the depression that comes after a great victory. There's this attack that comes after you have your biggest breakthrough, your biggest win. You, 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 you reach a goal that you've set in your life and you're like, I thought I'd be more satisfied with things after reaching this goal. And there's just thoughts that come and this mentality that comes. In our lives, we can struggle when these things pop up. I'm really good, I'm strong. I'm gonna stick to this diet. And then you watch TV and there's a thousand and one fast food commercials. Right? A thousand and one fast food commercials. The nature of what Jesus was going through may be on a different scale than our temptations, but we can pull some truths from his experience. We can apply the tools that he used to be victorious in our lives. Satan tells him, turn these stones into bread, and Jesus responds the perfect way. He says, I'm not gonna do that. For the Bible says, man shall not live on bread alone but every word that comes out from the mouth of God. And I'm telling you, when temptation comes, you know what our biggest downfall is? Is a lack of knowledge of the word of God. It's a lack of knowledge of truth. We are so surrounded by lies, and we believe our own lies. That's what depression is. Depression is a spiral of believing your own lie. And you keep thinking about that lie over and over and over and over. And the only thing that's gonna cut through anxiety and depression is truth. And they say, what is truth? Well, thy word is truth. The word of God is truth as to who you are and to whose you are. And Jesus responds that way. The truth of what God says cuts through the lies that are being spoken to you. And I'm gonna tell you this, it's not always the devil speaking those lies to you. 99% of the time, it's you speaking lies to you. It's you. There's this deep-rooted, self-destructive nature in all of us that tries to creep its head up. Well, Pastor Mike, it's easier for you to quote a Bible verse because you're a professional Christian. After all, you're a pastor, and you know that you've memorized the entire Bible. Bull crap. <laughs> I haven't memorized the whole Bible. In fact, I haven't memorized much of the Bible. I know my go-to verses. Right? I know verses I need for different situations. I'm being challenged right now to memorize or know one fact about each book of the Bible. I mean, that's a, that's a little bit of a task. And then this one guy's like, he knows one fact about every chapter of the Bible. That's, that's crazy. That's a lot. So what do you do? Well, if you know what your donut temptation is, then get some Bible verses, load up your clip with some Bible verses that combat that thing that keeps tempting you. understand who the nature, what the nature and the character of God is. If you get an evil thought that says to you, hey, steal a ream of paper from your job because you don't have any paper in your printer at home. We understand that that is not God. God is not trying to bless you with a ream of paper because your coworker forgot to put it in the cabinet. No, that's theft. And God doesn't want you in jail. God doesn't want you to lose your job. Right? So we have to understand that when things come, what is the nature of God? Who does God call me to be? 
You don't have to have memorized every verse in the Bible about not stealing to understand that that doesn't align with the character of God. So know this verse. Take every thought captive and every imagination and haughty thought that tries to exalt itself against the nature of God and bring it into submission. I like to think about strangle that thought into submission to what aligns with the word of God. So I don't have to know every verse in the Bible to know that that thought was not of God and I need to strangle it. That's the inward process. So that didn't work. So the devil tries again. Verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And Jesus says, nah, bro, I'm afraid of heights. No, he said, for it is written, he will command his angel to concern you and they'll lift you up. And Jesus says, it is also written. So just think about this for a second. The devil knows what the Bible says. The devil quotes scripture. That's a scary thought. The devil probably knows more Bible verses than 99% of Christians. So then we get all confused. We get all confused. Oh my God, God is speaking to me, quoted a Bible verse. Oh, it might be the devil quoting a Bible verse. But the, but, but the devil always quotes it out of context. And he always brings a lie. Did God really say? Does the Bible really? He always brings that doubt. He always brings it into a form of heresy. So Jesus comes back and says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So now Satan takes Jesus to this place of worship, tempts him again, tells him to jump off the, mount, jump off the temple. The angels will protect you. And Jesus answers again, do not tempt the Lord. And I love this passage, do not tempt the Lord thy God. Because many times we think we can do whatever we want and God's going to get our back. You know, Pastor Mike, we live under grace. Just do whatever I want and God's going to cover me. Okay. Maybe that has been the experience so far. I'm just wondering, what about the next time and he don't? And that's not great grammar, but that's for real. Jesus did not use his relationship with the Father for his advantage. He did not take advantage of his relationship and say, yeah, you know what? I could do whatever I want because God's my Father. He's always going to get my back. He's always going to protect me. One day, my daughter Michaela tempted the Lord thy Mike. <laughs> I would bring my kids in here and I'd put them on the stage from a young age. I'd make them jump off and I'd catch them. And so my kids always knew, daddy always catches them. They jump from something, daddy's going to catch them. So one day, I walk into the house, and we had like a landing, you know, like two sets of stairs with a landing, and my, my daughter's on the t middle of that landing there, and I walk in, I got my hands full of groceries, and before I can say anything, before she can say anything, she just runs and jumps off that landing, and I already got my hands full. What you going to do? Drop your kid or drop the eggs? Sorry, kid. No, no, I was kidding. In a split second, I dropped my bags. I caught my daughter. It was something crazy. It was awesome. I pride myself on it. Had to go buy more eggs. But wonder if I didn't. What if I didn't? And I mean, she had faith in me. She had trust in me. But she doesn't need to put me to the test like that. We don't need to put God to the test like that. Do not use your relationship with God to take advantage of the relationship with God. We should honor him and put him in a holy place and say, although I think I could get away with it, I don't need to tempt the Lord thy God. Verse eight says this, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in splendor. It says, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And that one just ticked him off. That one just ticked Jesus off. He says, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But really the funny part about this is, he was like, you're trying to offer me something that's already mine. 
You're trying to offer me something that I'm about to whoop your tail and take back and give to the people of the earth. I don't need to bow down and worship you. I'm just saying in today's society, we bow down and worship so many illegitimate things. We bow down and worship stars that are illegitimate, media stars that are illegitimate, desires of this life that are illegitimate, and it begins to destroy us because I don't have what my neighbor has. And we begin to worship those things, and it becomes part of the downfall, it becomes part of an anxiety. We cannot speak of temptation without first speaking of the victory that Christ had. He was victorious in this situation. In this box of donuts that I've been thinking about since they put them on the stand here, if I just, and it's been closed for a reason, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, as soon as you open this, I can just smell the aroma of sugary, glutinous pleasure. You know the dumbest thing to do when I'm on a diet? Is to stand right here. Mmm. Sprinkles. I'm not going to eat it, but let me just like, this is an apple fill joint. Mm. Just, it's a lot like the McDonald's apple pies, you know, the hot. How stupid is this, right? To sit here, just a lick. It's the dumbest thing to sit there and stare at the thing that tempts you. Come on, can I help somebody? Maybe you need to delete some access on your phone to certain websites. Come on, just trying to help somebody out today, like, like you're staring at the temptation that keeps getting you. We don't want to be responsible for that. Don't fix your eyes on the temptation. Fix your eyes on the Word of God. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So, well, Pastor Mike, I'm in great physical shape. That's not my problem. Well, good for you. Congratulations. I'm proud of you. But we should have some goals. Okay, like, well, you know, Pastor Mike, spiritually I'm good, so like, you know, fixing my eyes on Jesus. All right, so let's just, or maybe you're not as spiritual. Like, you know, it just seems over-spiritualized to put my eyes on Jesus and think about Jesus all the time. Okay, that's fine. Then how about you focus on your goals? Focus on a goal because temptation is always self-destructive against the goals. Saving for a house. And then your best buds, bro, we're going on a man's vacation. Want to go? Yeah. I mean, I can put on a credit card and I don't have to take my mortgage money. It's temptation. It's temptation. So we should set some physical, healthy physical goals. Healthy emotional goals, healthy spiritual goals. How about the goal of raising healthy children, having a healthy marriage, being financially stable, right? Setting proper goals in our lives and keeping our eyes on these godly goals, which will lead us out of temptation. We started with Hebrews 12, 1 that says this, therefore also we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? These are witnesses like Moses and Abraham and Enoch and Elijah. Men who in the book of Hebrews are the fathers of faith, the heroes of faith. If they could do it, they were the heroes of faith who did not waver in faith even before Christ. If they could do it, if they could be faithful to God, even before uh, Jesus Christ on the cross, they are the cloud of witnesses that are rooting us on. It says this, we have such a great cloud of witnesses. They've done it. They've run the race. They've steadfast, they were steadfast. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and sin. 
And I was like, okay, well, what is the weight in sin? Is there one specific weight in sin that so easily befalls all of us? And it isn't, there isn't really, you know, it's like each one of us, the thing that tempts us and the thing that we struggle with is as unique as our thumbprint. But the overall, the overarching thing is the lack of faith. The lack of faith that God has already empowered you to overcome every temptation that the enemy could throw at you. He has already given you the power. I'm skipping way down in my notes. So what's the answer? What do we need to do? We need to understand, and this is nothing new. These are the same three points that we're going to be going over pretty much this whole series. Number one is this, understand the grace of God. Understand the undeserved, unmerited grace of God, the favor of God on your life. Grace, 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 grace. The most important factor that we can rely on in any situation when a temptation comes is our ability to understand and receive the grace of God. I'm gonna tell you this, and this is not to like give you false hope or to put you down, but we're all gonna fall. We're all gonna fall short of the glory of God. We're all gonna mess up. We're all gonna make mistakes. We're all gonna bite into the donut from time to time. It's a fact. And as strong as we think we are and as close to God as we try to get, I just understand we're in a society today that is just ridden with depression and anxiety and poor self-image. Anytime you have a poor self-image, you're actually denying the image of God that's within you. It's falling short. It's missing a mark. Understand the grace of God. If we have been saved by grace, why would we think that we live the Christian life by our own ability and our own power? It was not my own ability and my own power that saved me. It is not my own ability and my own power that's gonna sustain me. I am sustained consistently by the favor of God in our lives. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this, seeing then that we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For if we did not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus went through every temptation that we're gonna go through, yet he did not crumble, he did not fall. That's the benchmark, that's the level of perfection. So then we go to the throne of grace. You see, the journey out of temptation is truly a journey to the throne of grace. That's the hiking trail, right? That's the end zone. That's, that's finishing the golf course. It's getting there. It's getting to the summit that Josh is hiking to. The throne of grace. And that's where we find rest. It's so funny, man. It's like in society today, we just brag on being workaholics. Man, I'm just working so much. I'm just so busy. Well, then you're kind of being foolish. If you're being so busy that busy is the goal, you're being foolish. Finding rest and being healthy for your family should be the goal. Getting things done in the proper amount of time and creating boundaries for your time should be the goal. So you throw a little bit of weight, man, kids grow up so fast. I have a 21-year-old, 19-year-old, 11-year-old. They grow up so fast. And I just want to be busy and working for busy sake. When we'll invest in our, their lives, be the example that they need. God's not going to get it all done for you. God sent you to this earth to get things done, but he has also given you the grace to do it and the space to rest. Let's not violate Sabbath rest, Amen. Number two is the word works, man. The word of God works. The word of God will not return void. It will accomplish exactly what it was set forth to do. And here's the last one, phone a friend. 
I can't say this enough. I've worked on it. I worked on it for seven years straight to find my friends, to find other pastors that I could lean on and call to. They didn't have to hide from. I'm not the easiest person to get along with. It's not easy to be friends with me. It's not easy for me to find friends. I worked really, really hard to find friends. And the Bible says this, for the person who desires to have friends, they must first show themselves to be friendly. So you want some friends first? Get the stank off your face. Get the stank off your face. Nobody wants to go be friends with stank, right? So when you see people, smile, make eye contact. If you're the person who's just always like this, no one wants to be your friend, right? That, that, that's why you're struggling. So work on that. Work on your face, right? Work on thinking about other people. When someone pops into your mind, send them a text message. There's some people, oh, you know, I was thinking about them today. Bull. Bull. I never believe that. When someone says, oh, I was thinking about them too. No, you weren't. Maybe they were, but I'm just calling their bluff. What'd you do about it? What'd you do about it? Man, that person's in the hospital. Yesterday, I was just thinking about it. What'd you do about it? Well, nothing. I just thought. And there's a, well, then shut up. You're not a good friend. For real, you're not a good friend. If someone pops into your mind, be faithful to this. If someone pops into your mind, just send them a text. Hey, thinking about you, all good? Simple. You know, listen, you ain't going to catch me talking on the phone. I don't like talking on the phone. I can feel awkward. Don't FaceTime me. That's weird. <laughs> FaceTime my kids. That's about it. You know, like, but te I'll text you all day long, right? A quick text. Hey, thinking about you. Everything good? Easy. Be a friend so that you can have friends in your life as well. Amen? Let's close this out. So Pastor Mike, what can I change today to change my life? Well, stop eating Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> right? Christ so Christianity is so confusing and it's so full of these like, you need to do more. You need to read your Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to speak in tongues more. You need to go give to the poor more. Okay, maybe. But really, if you just want to get better, stop doing the thing that's destroying you. I only got to stop one thing instead of doing 20 new things. Oh, my God. No other preacher is going to preach that to you. Pastor Mike, I just have such an anger problem, so I'm thinking about doing counseling, and then I'm going to, like, read my Bible, and I'm going to do, like, a, a, a meditation plan. Okay, that's great. How about you just stop being a jerk? That's one step. That's one event. That's not 29 other things for you to stop being angry. Just stop it. Your mom needs you to give you a bow bow. Right, you the kid on the grocery store floor screaming and embarrassing everybody, and then he's still doing that 45. Stop it! It's so much easier to stop one thing than to start 25 new. Come on. And while doing that, stop condemning yourself. Stop beating yourself up. That's what the enemy does. Live and operate in the grace of God. The list goes on and on. We could go all day long talking about this, but we are over time. The plans we create are based on the reality that we see. The plans that we create are based on the reality that we see. The plans that God makes are based on the reality that he sees. And his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He has such a bigger plan for your life that you could ever dream or imagine. He has things in store for your life that if you would just submit to his plan would blow your mind. But we have to get our eyes off the temporal or the temporary and we have to put our eyes on the eternal. What has God called me to do in my life today? Who has he called me to be? Who has he called me to help? Who has he called me to impact? Because we get so self-serving. And we need to be careful to not make ourselves our own God. Father, we come to the name of Jesus today. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to be our comforter, our helper, and our guide. 
I rebuke any depression or anxiety that's tried to attach itself to the hearts or the minds of this congregation or anybody watching online. I rebuke the anxiety of social awkwardness and being afraid of large crowds in the name of Jesus. God, I pray the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would penetrate our hearts and our minds, that there would be rest in our hearts emotionally, that you would affirm us as your sons and daughters. You would affirm us as the called out ones, your chosen people, the generation that's alive today. Lord, give us confidence to be your people who are called by your name. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember who we belong to. Help us out of temptation. Help us to say no when others place that temptation in front of us or we do it ourselves. Help us to have the grace for ourselves and understand your grace that is unwavering. Forgive us if there's anything in our lives that has been mispleasing to you. Wash it away. We repent. We change our minds. We change our vision. We change our thinking towards you. Cover us with your love. Cover us with your mercy. Lead us. Guide us. Direct us into all truth. Help us in our relationships. Help us in our jobs. Help us to be wise over our finances. Help us to show love to those around us. As we leave here today, Lord, I pray that we are protected and safe. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love ya. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.